Hello, everyone. Apologies for the delay. I'm Chuck Harris, Executive Director of the Texas Exes, and welcome to our second of three live interviews for Longhorns on the Hill. This event is a chance for alumni to help tell the UT story on a national stage. I want to thank all of you Longhorns who have been reaching out to your members of Congress this week and telling your story. It's powerful and it's what makes a difference here. This is, if nothing else, a fascinating time to check in with the man who this summer assumed one of the most awesome responsibilities I can think of, shepherding a massive public institution through one of the most tumultuous times in recent memory. Just last week, Jay Hartzell was officially named the 30th president of the University of Texas. And even though I know he doesn't want us to lavish him with too much praise, I can tell you from the beginning, in the, I've been in the being with him in the room a lot, and he's the right person for this moment. Jay was, of course, an incredibly successful dean at UT, UT's Macomb School of Business, and has also served as a member of the Texas X Board of Directors. We've really gotten to know him and seen the way he works. He's pragmatic, he's compassionate, he's inspiring, and he is, I think most importantly, a great listener. Please welcome our friend and fellow Longhorn, President Hartzell. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, good to see you and a pleasure to join you. Uh, thank you all for taking time and for helping with this great Longhorns on the Hill initiative. I do have some questions for you, Jay. We'll do uh, some prepared and then if we have time, we'll take uh, questions from the audience. I wanna first apologize to everybody. Um, our president was here dutifully in time. Uh, it was a technical challenge getting everybody online. So um, with the first, Jay, what's been the biggest challenge for you so far since stepping into the role? Well, other than uh, figuring out Zoom and Microsoft Teams, uh, you know, I think I think honestly the hard part has been with between COVID and the race challenges that we're all facing on campus and in society more broadly. I think it's trying to make sure we keep making progress going forward in a way that unites us rather than perhaps, div perhaps divides us. And so we've all faced tough issues uh, in the last several months, um, but trying to keep all of these things together logistically and play that is a uniting uh, effort for, for all the Longhorns has, has been probably the biggest challenge to me. How do you think, um, I saw the note you sent out Monday uh, regarding the testing. What's the feeling on campus? How, do you, how are student and faculty and others um, doing with, I guess what we call now the new normal, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, I really think it's gone. I mean, knock on wood, it's gone maybe as well or maybe even a little better than, than we expected. The, the challenge at some level is it feels like it's gone pretty well, but our confidence intervals are wide. So we're not uh, super confident in the exact state of things uh, because we're still trying to get people to get tested more frequently to find out how prevalent the disease is in our community. Uh, but based on what we know, uh, you know, so far so good. We've gotten through the first football game. Um, the, the numbers among our student body are, I mean, pretty good compared to other student bodies around the country. Um, we haven't had any signs so far of, of disease transmission from students in classrooms to faculty or staff, for example. So all that is looking pretty good given, you know, what we're, what we're all facing. How do you feel, um, you know, this, this, there's so much new that's happening. You know, everything's the first time we do this, the first, you know, it's the first virtual uh, Longhorns on the Hill for us. But um, how do you feel the pandemic is uh, influencing higher education? In particular, as you know, the group we're with today are, are champions for um, this topic uh, all year round in particular this week. Yeah, I think it's, it's gonna be really fascinating to see where things, how things are different in say, you know, two to five years um, than perhaps we think that they would have been without COVID. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things we probably have all been talking about is how COVID has accelerated change. So it's, we all have known that technology, for example, has been disrupting higher education, but if anything, the last several months have, has, have accelerated that change. So, you know, I think a few things, I think one is, um, a lot of our willingness to try technology to in with our students, with our research, I think uh, we have more willingness now than we had before. So some things I've heard from faculty to give you examples. Students are showing up more for Zoom office hours than they did for regular office hours. 
So if you're in West Campus and you have a short question, it's easier to zoom in for a 10 minute question with a professor than to walk across campus, go to his or her office and ask it in person. So that's good. Um, we've seen more uh, ability to get amazing guest speakers in classes. So mm -hmm. I'm not asking somebody to fly to Austin, take a day or two out of their schedule uh, to come speak to students for an hour. Instead, you, you know, you're asking them to sort of zoom in and that part has gone really well. So it's things like that I think will probably stick. Um, I think those kinds of changes will, will be there for a while. I think our willingness to blend face to face with sort of remote online things uh, will be increased. Um, all that said, I also believe that we're, we've been reminded over and over again uh, how, what is special about being together in person. Uh, and it's easier to make connections. Um, the spring, we had relationships already in place when we went online so people knew each other in a class for example the fall is harder because we're starting from scratch and so how do you get to know people from zero uh, in a classroom or on a campus setting um, remotely and without having that kind of in-person shared experience i think that's been, been a bit of a challenge yeah it's um you know as you know as i sort of think about that um you know there's so many big meaty topics uh, confronting culture and opinions and people. Um, how do you think about um, sort of where the argument or the discussion for higher education kind of fits into that, in particular with the lawmakers? It's like, how do, how do, we, how do we take, to use a very broad term, the moment uh, where there's all of these kind of forces uh, creating change and accelerating things is how, how do we kind of dovetail that our, our what we what we're trying to focus on into that right all right so a few things that come to mind so one is and, and I know I've seen the materials you all prepare prepare for everybody about the case for higher education uh, which I think were great but one thing that is clear uh, especially in COVID is that people who are better educated have more technical skills, have more ability to adapt, have fared better when there are technological shocks and have fared better through COVID. So for example, if you look at unemployment rates or income levels or just how people have, have gotten through COVID or really honestly through almost any recession, uh, education is a huge, uh, provides a huge advantage to be able to, to buffer those, those winds and those storms. So, so one is just that the, the current crisis, I think, sharpens the perspective that education provides an ability for people to be more resilient, more agile to adapt to change, and that shows up in all kinds of ways. So that, that's one part. Another part that I think it speaks to, especially the role of the top research university like ours, is that we've got the real ability to, uh, for our faculty, for our research mission, to help society. And so one, one example that comes to mind here um, is Jason McClellan. Jason is a, a professor here. We hired him from Dartmouth Medical School, and in part because we had some world-class electron microscopes and lab facilities that were arguably even better than what Dartmouth could provide. Plus, you know, Austin is not um, Hanover, New Hampshire, so we have some advantages there. Mm -hmm. So we're him down from Dartmouth to Texas, he is an expert in coronaviruses uh, as a class of viruses. Then COVID-19 hits and within a week of the sort of the beginning of having the, the source data available, he's mapped out what COVID-19 looks like and modeled out what I've now learned is the spike protein and is a, is a way that, that COVID attacks us. And that's important because knowing how that works provides us a way to attack COVID. And now I think four out of the top five leading vaccines are using Jason's work to figure out how to come up with a, with a more effective uh, vaccine for everybody. So here you have a world-class scientist uh, who's positioned and doing great work. In comes a, a shock that affects us all so profoundly. And Jason's able to take his expertise, his lab and his skills and apply them to this, this problem. And so, you know, almost I, it's hard to think of another setting aside from a top research university where we have that kind of talent worrying about things as specialized as coronaviruses 
who can then apply that talent to something like COVID-19. Yeah, I think, yeah, obviously it's really, as we kind of sit on our task force here, it's been great to see how the universities, you know, you would normally think of it as sort of the scientists, but like the business communities got involved. You've got supply chain experts who are critical to this. So it's it's really kind of interesting to see the meshing of all of these disciplines to to kind of achieve the outcome where where prior I think people would have thought this all happened in a lab, but to actually you're talking about testing and and, and just how people even think about yours. We're starting to now move into this. Will people trust the vaccine or not? So there's kind of a for lack of a term, kind of a PR or marketing that'll go along. Anyway, so it's been an interesting thing to watch it evolve. And it it sort of reminds me of some of the cross cross disciplinary things we do here that are emerging uh, that I think sort of stand out as well. Yeah, I agree. Everything from social workers worrying to how people face these tough times, you know, there's more depression, there's more mental illness um, in, in our environment today. So there's people working on that. I've had, we have faculty who are advising uh, the governor and the city and how to reopen economically. So what are the economic sort of trade-offs and how do we think about um, where we should go as a society from a economic activity level um, to, as you talked about, you know, we've Internally, for example, we had some wonderful people help us from an, an advertising communications marketing standpoint. How do we encourage students to, to go through voluntary testing for COVID? Uh, so having, how do you get the message right to appeal to people to work together to protect the common good? So there's so many different angles and it just shows, you know, when we all unite toward a common mission of trying to get through this together, all the different kinds of people and talent and skills we can bring to bear on a problem. No, no question about it. Is there anything you're sort of most proud of? Does any, something stand out and all that in terms of innovating or contributing or is there kind of a uh, aha that that um, sticks out in your mind if you had to pick one? Yeah, I think I think the main thing, um, which is probably not one concise example, but would be how people have pulled together really to help our students. And I saw it when I was dean and when I was transitioning into the interim president job. But you know, we we went from a in-person university almost exclusively to a exclusively online university in about three weeks. And the a lot of our professors use Zoom um, to give you an example, but the first day of class, UT Austin delivered eight million minutes of Zoom. So the scale of that is pretty enormous. And I watched professors help each other, learn how to do this very rapidly, all for the sake of trying to get back in the classroom virtually. And one that hit me was a professor that I knew that who was retiring in six weeks. And he was in meeting after meeting, trying to learn the technology to be able to teach remotely for, for the remaining six weeks of his UT career. Um, but it was all for his students. And so there were a lot of inspirational things, but if, if there's one thing, it's been the united response to help our students continue to learn and make progress in the, in the classroom, even when the classroom's defined as online. Yeah. Hey, so um, normally we'd all be in uh, Washington together. And so I'm going to give you a head start for next year when you're with, when you come with me to Washington, right? So we'll do this together next year, right? So right. I'm gonna give you a head start. If we were there and we were at uh, the breakfast or one of the, the barbecue and Shiner events that we had historically done, you'd get two questions. I'm going to ask them here. First is what federal policies are top of mind for you right now? Which do you think are the most important? Okay, so let's go, let's go, let's go, uh, go ahead now. Yeah, uh, so yeah, then, give me a head start so you can you can got it. And the shiner, the shiner is not at breakfast, right? Those are two separate events. Yes, yes, that's okay. correct. I, yeah, I, I want to make sure I know what I'm in for next year. Uh, <laughs> now, I think you know, I think if, if, for me, one of the things I would think about first from a federal standpoint is um, our orientation towards international students being able to come and study in the U.S. and I get all the national security concerns and we have to be very careful in today's environment. Um, but I think we still want the best and brightest from around the world to come to the US, to come to Texas in particular, to come to UT and some will stick. And that's a great thing 
for Austin, for Texas, and for the country if the world's smartest people, most talented people, decide that we're their destination. So um, with what COVID's done, visa challenges, other challenges with getting the best and brightest to come to the U.S., I'd like to make sure we retain our position as a country, as the world's leading provider of higher education. Yeah, and sort of dovetailing underneath that, the the other question we get uh, routinely, and I know you get it, is why in the world does UT need more money? I mean, can't we just top, tap into that oil endowment? And, uh, and I'm sure you get a lot of that. And um, I'm sh I know our audience would love to hear how you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one, one part I think is just to make sure people understand, you know, we are often, depends on where you are, criticized or bragged about for having, I think, the second biggest endowment in the country. So first sort of point of clarification, that's an endowment for our entire system and um, not only for UT Austin. So if you calculate things like, for example, endowment per student and do that at the system level, then the picture is not quite as rich or rosy as many would perceive it to be if you assume that that entire endowment was at the disposal of just our campus. So that's sort of part one is kind of make sure we're clear about that part. The second part, and I've seen your the work that you all do, that you put together these great graphics with kind of the BVO and where the money is coming from. But the, the long run trend, uh, we do have a, a, a good endowment at the system level, but that endowment has needed to provide uh, and take up some of the slack for what's been a decline in state funding over decades. And you know, back when back when you were in school in the, in the last century, Chuck, um, the the funding from the state was probably in the range of 50 to 60 percent of our budget, and now it's in the 10 to 15 percent range. So, so there's been a, a, a change, and part of that is because um, you know we're able to to do more things as a university and and have a very big impact in many many ways. But that there's needed to be a, a resource increase to offset. Um, the long run trends in state funding. And that's partly why uh, across all of higher education, um, schools like ours, tuition's gone up. It's because it's it's able to, to help keep propelling us forward, um, even at a time when other sources have been declining. So that, that's the second part. The third part I would say is, um, you know, we, I think, are very good stewards of resources. We're constantly ranked as one of the best values in the country a great return on investment both for the state and for um, for our students. So I think that in my language as a business school person, the ROI, the return on investment is really good. So I think people should feel comfortable that the next dollar we're getting is going to go into into our students and our research and in a way that will continue to produce a positive return um, on those investments. So you know we tend to do things at scale and so the resource needs are, are big. But you see these great positive impacts that we have both on our students and our research, and, and it's a good return on investment. Yeah. So if we're, if we're successful, which of course we will be in securing that, um, what do you see as sort of the next big thing? What's on the horizon for UT as you, as you move forward? Yeah, I think um, you know a lot of the, the work now that is going underway, um, I'm sure is going to continue. And so things, like, you know, think about where society is taking us from a technology, data, AI, machine learning, um, the future of work and, and jobs. You know, UT is very well positioned to not only weigh in on those deep issues from a research standpoint, but also to prepare students for that. And so I think, you know, five or 10 years from now, you look down and, and we will be seen as one of the providers, leading providers of really talented graduates who are well positioned for the, the, the society of the future, whether that's in the private sector, public sector, um, medicine and, and, and the like. Another thing I think that you'll continue to see, there's more and more work being done where, where fields overlap. And so, you know, it's no longer just sort of, you're in your silo, I'm in my silo. A lot of these issues, like you mentioned COVID, Chuck, and they're bringing people from across the, the university to come together to work on problems. And so, I think you'll see us continue to, to do more there. Um, and then I think it's partly on us to figure out, we've got these tremendous assets from being in Texas, 
being in Austin, 500,000 plus living alums, and how do we take advantage of all of that? And so I think as, you, as we weigh into these societal trends, part of what I, I believe you'll see from us is an intentionality about how do we use our alumni base? How do we use our location in Austin or in Texas in, in a broad way uh, to be distinctive, to be uh, the world-class university we all believe that we are and can continue to be, but in a Texas way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no doubt. The um, You mentioned a little bit about alumni. I have heard you say many times, if you had to put a list of five things together, you know, our alumni be on, on that list. Um, how do you, you know, you're alumni yourself. So I think um, your own journey has given you um, a greater appreciation for some of the topics I think that we're, we're confronted with now just having experienced it. I mean, how could, how could they not be? Um, so as you look out, um, do you have any particular messages to alumni and how they could support their school, help support you? support the, the mission beyond, you know, obviously the champions that they are uh, at the Capitol and then when they go home uh, as well. We have, um, as you know, many advocates for us that um, that, that help uh, carry that message. So. Yeah, well, the first part would be, would be to say thank you. And I know the crowd out there today is not even a random sample of Longhorn Texas Exodus, right? So it's a great group of people that are willing to take this kind of time out to be engaged. So, so thank you. One part is to stay engaged and reach out to, to you know, the exes, to the campus, find something where your passion is. And that could be anything from a part of our research mission to a part of uh, our student body, one of our academic programs. It's such a big place that almost anything that you think you get excited about trying to find a way to get engaged, uh, odds are we have it somewhere on the 40 acres and we'd love to find a way to engage um, with you. The other thing I would say is, you know, clearly uh, we are often talking to people about philanthropic or financial support, but there's a lot, there are a lot of ways to give back. And uh, for those that um, may be at different parts of their sort of giving journey, there's ways to give time, expertise, talent, creativity. So, you know, to give you one example, today's environment, the job market is, is tough for our students and the internship market is tough for our students. And I know there's something Chuck you've been working on with UT, but there are ways for our alumni to really help our students in a world where they may not be able to find an internship or the one that they had promised didn't materialize. And they may be looking for jobs in, in areas where typical years they would have, you know, employers would have come to campus more readily and more easily. And so um, having, having alumni help our students navigate the post UT world, I think is one of the great things that we can all aspire to try to do. I've got a, a couple personal questions. If you're if you're open to that, you open to sure. all right. Um, so I'm one of the things, that, screen, so it's it's kind of hard for me to say no. Yeah, put, not that I put you on the spot or anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, you know when we're when we're in Washington, we you know we have our sessions together and then we kind of fan out and go meet the delegation in sort of member meetings and staff meetings and that sort of thing. Um, in, in my experience in doing that, the most powerful part of that is when individual alumni sort of tell their story of what UT meant to them and how it's changed the trajectory of their career. And, you know, it's it's very personal. Um, I was wondering if you might share if, if you were sitting, if you were the, the younger Jay, not the president or something, you might how, would, how might you answer that question in a meeting like that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I will try to do it without um, tearing up too much, but you know, I think, so my journey, I went to a, not a great high school. I went to a small undergrad school in San Antonio Trinity University. It was wonderful for me. Um, I don't know if I would have been able to, to thrive at UT yet. I went out and got a job and, and was looking at grad schools and was thinking about getting an MBA, couldn't quite decide what to do. And a professor connected me with a, a professor at uh, UT named Laura Starks and who ran the PhD program in the finance department and somehow she let me in took a chance um, we, we, when we all showed up on, on the day that we were all first on campus together the, the, the incoming class of the PhD program we went around the room and I thought oh my gosh these are all way smarter more qualified people than I am and I can't believe that UT took a chance on me and 
so there was a part for me that was I felt just lucky to get here uh, the first time. And then, you know, with the working with the faculty, with my classmates, um, I, I grew to really like the idea of being a professor and somehow ended up at a job at NYU, which was, you know, a, a relatively hard job to get in finance. And and I gave a lot of, you know, the bulk of the credit was to Laura, to my my, my faculty and the environment at UT. So it, it took me from, you know, somebody who quite awkwardly in hindsight grew up in Oklahoma, came to Texas, and all of a sudden, you know, I got to be a professor at NYU in New York. And I had these moments of like, wow, what happened? And it was because of UT. There was no way that I get that that leap from where I had come from uh, my background, my family's background to get to be on in Manhattan um, teaching finance to Goldman Sachs and investment bankers at night. You know, that's just doesn't that that was something for me it was a big jump. Then, you know, UT called and offered me the chance to come back home and I never thought I would get to come back and was worried about just would I keep the job, would I get tenure. Somehow it all kind of worked out. So, you know, I felt like UT really made a took a chance, made a bet on me, and it it propelled me in ways. And not only did I find something I really loved doing, but it opened doors for me that otherwise never would have been opened. So, I'm I'm extremely grateful to the university because um, I I feel like they made a bet when others might not have made that same bet. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um it's great. I mean, that's what I love about this week is um, everybody has their version of that story, um, which is great. And it, it sort of crosses all demographics and careers and it's, it's really neat. Um, it's really obviously the power of education. Um, the uh, I have two more. Um, one, uh, please take this the right way, uh, because you, as you've just started as president, um, it may be fair or unfair to ask if you've obviously not started thinking about your legacy as president, but um, do you have a thought when you look back, when you future cast five, 10, 20 years down the road, what, what you'd wanna be remembered for during your, your time here? Hopefully long and successful and <laughs> you're in a very long gray beard of, of giving <laughs> advice to incoming freshmen. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a tough question because I've been worried about five, 10 or 20 days, not, yeah. you know, always five ten or 20 years. Um, you know, I, for me, I think like all of us that work with university, probably, um, I, I've spent less time, and I felt this way as Dean, spent less time thinking about my legacy or what I wanted it to look like that I had done, and more just, could I leave the university in a better place? And, you know, we all talk about, can we leave it better than we found it? And that's, that's my goal is, you know, I, I, I see no reason why we can't compete even more on the academic side for faculty, for students, for staff with the, the very elite publics and many of the privates. So, you know, we talk a lot about Michigan and Berkeley and maybe it's Cornell and Duke. And what I'd like is, you know, at the at whatever run I get to have in this role, I'd like for us to narrow those gaps and compete more and and someday start to win more and more of those battles over where professors go, where students go, where when you're crossing down the street of New York and somebody says name the top universities in the US, that people think of us very, very quickly among that set of small schools, small number of schools. So that that to me is the goal, is that we are seen as and known for having this impact and as being one of the very top universities in, in the country. Well, I, I can't um, imagine a purpose and outcome that wouldn't be more in line with all of us alums. I think we all share that that future hope, and I we have absolute confidence that we'll get there. We have a with you at the helm. We have a few. I well, left a few minutes for questions from the audience, so let me let me hit you with those. Um, what is your best piece of advice for freshmen entering campus in the new virtual world. How's that? How's that for a softball? Yeah. <laughs> Can we go back to 20 years from now? No, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, the main the main advice, and I would give this just a little bit different flavor of it pre-COVID, but the main advice is to get involved. And 
you know, UT is to me the kind of university, almost everything is here and almost everything is world class, it, but it's more up to the student to dive into it. And it's a big place. And so for students who kind of want to skim along the surface of the university and not really embrace what's here, one can do that more easily here because it is big. So the main advice I often have is, is to get involved, to get engaged. Um, one of the things that, that I like is the idea of pick something to get involved with in kind of your home discipline. So if you're in history, then find something in history of the College of Liberal Arts. But find one that's a little outside the comfort your comfort zone or something that's broader in campus, something that's a cross campus initiative, um, whether that's a you know Greek life or another social organization or a not for profit cause that does something, but find something that's outside your sort of zone comfort zone. Um, with COVID, those challenges are a little harder. So you know we're we're do, trying to do a lot to make it easier for students to know how to get involved even when they're on campus, much less than they would have been um, without COVID, uh, but but it's going to be more virtual. You have to join student orgs with Zoom meetings and do a lot of the same kinds of things that we're all finding each other having to do, um, but it's still kind of down to its, its nuts and bolts. It's uh, get involved, get engaged, find one or two things to really dive into. The other thing I'll tell freshmen is just it sounds obvious, but let's go to class. Um, and you know, Chuck, I know you did really well in school, but some of us might have slept in on occasion and missed a class or two. And if you miss two college classes, like you missed your Tuesday, Thursday, all of a sudden it's like the equivalent of having missed a month in high school and you can be pretty, be, you know, fairly far behind pretty quickly. So I often say, you know, it sounds simple because every every student who gets to us has done really well. Um, so it sounds easy, but just keep going to class. And, and that might mean now zooming in, but but taking it seriously and not play on your phone while you're actually turning off your video and screw around. Yeah, I was at uh, Rolling Hall and you know, if if you'd had buildings that nice back when <laughs> I was here, I, I might have gone to class more often. But, um, but anyway, um, two more. Uh, do you have, uh, if you sort of think the long game, um, is there, a, is there a sort of a research priority that you see as sort of the highest in terms of, I mean, there's lots of areas, but as you sort of think of the long game, so we've got all the COVID things happening, obviously public health and all that is of the moment, but if you look on the long game, do you see, um, you know, so how would you just find the big top research priorities for the university? Yeah, a couple of things come to mind and I, you know, I hesitate to, to, to kind of pick a field because it's, you know, it's unfair probably to all the other fields and I get blasted by, Who's your who's your favorite child kind of thing? Um, but I'll give you a couple of things I think about that 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 are in the minds of us as a leadership team. Um, one is we we I think it's important for us to continue to focus on on impact and in academics that has a particular meaning where we really want to change the way people are thinking about things and not just incremental work, you know, one more small innovation um, in some way that that is not really going to change much about the way the world works or thinks or, or approaches a problem um, and that also speaks to the idea that we should be tackling big problems and not small problems so so one is sort of impact the other is i think it's also important for us to think about where we have real strengths and advantages and i was on a call this morning uh, with an alum who's in london um, who is is uh, made an amazing gift to help uh, stand up a sustainability institute and you know, for, this is one example, but Texas as a state is poised to be, and it probably already is, the main energy state in the country, if not the world. And so, and that energy writ large, and and from traditional oil and gas to solar to wind to you name it. So that's something that we really have a, a differentiating, a differentiable capability that that you know, pick your other favorite top school. Um, you know, Carnegie Mellon can't say the same thing. So, so I think it's thinking about those places where we have these real advantages and from the energy sector in a very broad way. Um, you mentioned uh, health, you know, the, the fact that we have a, a new burgeoning medical school is going to be really exciting, not only for health in Central Texas, but also for uh, our chance to make an impact in an industry that's 20% of GDP. 
So, so there, there are things like that where we have a real moment and a real ch chance. Um, so that, that, those are two things I guess I would be thinking about is impact and then what's differentiable about being in Austin, Texas at a, at a giant world-class university like ours. Yeah. All right, we got time for one more. This, it's, this is going to be high and in tight, so um, <laughs> get ready. Um, exactly. Really. Yes. Um, what's been the uh, most fun part about being president of UT? <laughs> I mean, with, all the, with all the things going on, um, I, I can only imagine the stress and the uh, the the kind of things that go along with that, but <clears throat> like anything that I'm, I know there's I know you and I know there's some things that are um, have been a lot of fun for you. So love yeah, you for that. I guess I guess I would say a couple things. One, um, it, it, a lot of it comes down to getting to be around people, and part of that fun part of the job is kind of shut off right now because we can't travel around the same way, and you know we we can't have some of the same events that we typically would have. And so some of that's harder. Um, but I, to give you a sense of it, I had a week where in about three days in a row, um, we welcomed back students to gone to Texas. So I got to go out and, and it, there weren't as many students as normal, but I got to see some students again. I got to fire the cannon for the first time. That was really cool. Uh, <laughs> Evo came out. Uh, there, was, there was the, you know, the cheer squad. Um, that was great right to remind us all kind of this the student piece and the passion of the university that was one the next day um i got to be around a, a philanthropist who wants to help uh one of our faculty members in the moody college she does amazing work around uh to help people who stutter and so he wants to take her work and make it national and international in scope so that was you get to see a star faculty member with a philanthropist who's not a ut grad who just yeah. wanted to amplify our work. And then the third day, I got to show the chancellor around and meet some of our faculty. And I had, we had him meet uh, Jason McClellan, I mentioned before, and, and then got to take him over to the, um, the Advanced Computing Center and got to have him meet uh, the faculty there. And we recruited this superstar uh, professor. She joined us from MIT. And to get to get to be around her and that environment, and they're doing work with, for example, Indy Anderson about how to visualize breast cancer tumors and how to attack them. And so you get this, you know, that, that was a week. You get the student piece, the passion for UT, fire the cannon. You get this chance to take our research and amplify it across the country with help of others. And then you get to see uh, Karen Wilcox was the, was the TAC professor and Jason McClellan and you see people we've hired away from MIT and Dartmouth who are really doing just amazing things. So that that week in a nutshell was kind of what's fun about being president. That's great. Well, Jay, I appreciate first uh, being with us today. Uh, second, um, even in your short term, I appreciate all the time you've taken to be with alumni. We've done uh, multiple events together, so I appreciate um, your focus and your appreciation for the 500,000 strong out there. It's uh, it's recognized and appreciated. I want to thank everybody else for coming today. Uh, the work you do matters a lot. Um, I appreciate the flexibility uh, with our virtual version of this. Uh, as you've heard from the president, um, rest assured, we will be back in person, live and in color next year. Um, so we'll look forward shine, to seeing you then. All right, Chuck. Uh, Yes, for all. sure. There's actually decent barbecue in Washington. You won't believe it, but it's it's not bad. Uh, I think it's called Hill Country Barbecue, by the way. Anyway, we'll have a great time and some breakfast tacos. Uh, I'll turn it now back over to the advocacy program manager, Rachel Ostermont. Back to you, Rachel. Well, thank you so much to President Hartzell and to our own executive director, Chuck Harris, for this great conversation about higher education today. Tomorrow for our last Longhorns on the Hill event, we'll hear from Dell Medical School Dean Clay Johnston and Cockrell Engineering School Dean Sharon Wood with CNN correspondent Rosa Flores sharing how their colleges have contributed to the fight against COVID-19. Today, there are two more actions that you can take to support UT Austin. By texting Longhorn or STORY to 52886, you'll receive action links. These action links are also accessible on Texas X's social media. Whether you share your Longhorn story on your personal social media today or tomorrow by hashtagging UTChangeMyWorld, 
or use our action template to share UT Austin's higher education priorities with members of Congress. All actions show that our alumni step up during important times for the university. We're looking forward to hearing from the deans tomorrow. Thanks again and hook them.